Hello friends, I am Dr. General McLean. Today we will see about awake facial surgeries performed under maxillary and mandibular nerve blocks. I have spent few years of an experimenting these maxillary and mandibular nerve blocks. This is done uh, uh, some years before. I like to share my knowledge through my YouTube channel. Uh, I have no uh, disclaimer in, uh, in uh, or getting money from any people in sharing these videos, nothing. It's about sharing now knowledge. So please do subscribe my YouTube channel, like and comment. Uh, critics always welcome. Now moving before into the topic, do, can, can we do awake facial surgeries under maxillary nerve blocks? Unless we have a successful maxillary and a mandibular nerve block, we will be able to do facial surgeries awake. And who are the demanding patients for awake facial surgeries? I'll be sharing those videos with you. It's a it consent been obtained. These are very poor patients done in government hospitals. So let's see. This we all know, the beauty of God's creation, isn't it? So, two anesthesiologists or two regional anesthesia per se, to, or to me, I would say regional anesthesia is an art. Our area is in interest for maxillary nerve block is, this is a temporal process of temporal bone, maxillary process of the mandibular bone, which max, maxillary bone, which forms the zygomatic arch. This is the condylar process of mandible. This is a conoid process of mandible, which forms the mandibular fossa. That is why where we insert a needle to do the blind ma maxillary and mandibular nerve block. You tilt it 10 degree, posterior and superior for um, to get the paresthesia of the ma ma mandibular territory for a for successful uh, mandibular nerve block and you direct your needle towards the lower cap lower eyelid you will enter in the terigo palatine fossa to deposit the drug you will get a successful maxillary nerve block this is a cadaveric image where you can see the trigeminal ganglion in the middle cranial fossa. To discuss how I am going to drag my topic, and I'm not going to drag my topic, make it more interesting is the relevant anatomy, the cadaveric anatomy to concern to the maxillary and mandibular nerve block and the techniques, what, what we used to learn, how I how I myself to learn the sonar anatom anatomy of maxillary and mandibular nerve blocks and how I do it and few case scenarios. I, I didn't publish it. Uh, I did a water bath technique to learn um, the maxillary, uh, how to perform maxillary nerve block and a mandibular nerve block. There are a lot of confusing articles. I would say truly I searched a lot. There are a lot of confusing articles which, which will misguide you. And there are good, very good articles describing the sonar anatomy over the pterygopalatine fossa and also the mandibular fossa. I'll show you that. This is a basic skull description. When you tilt it laterally, you will see the mandibular fossa, which is formed by the zygomatic arch. That's the external auditory meatus. That's a condylar process of mandible, coronoid process of mandible, and that's a zygomatic arch, which forms a mandibular fossa. So midpoint of the fossa, you insert a needle, you will hit a bone. What bone is that? That's a lateral pterygoid plate. Usually lateral pterygoid plate are much thinner and flatter in uh, certain individuals, but in this, individual in this skull the it is much broad you can hold it because sometimes it is even much smaller you can't even hold it 
that's a lateral delicate plate look at the distance from the needle to the foramen ovale that is 10 degree posterior and superior and look at the distance from the lateral delicate plate to the pterygopalatine fissure that's towards the lower eye so that much this distance so our landmark is the lateral delicate plate as you see here and moreover, the foramen ovale is in line with the external auditory meatus. This we, we need to know. So this is a, another dissection done by me. You can see the, the sagittal section and you can see the uh, axial section. That's a middle cranial fossa. You can see the trigeminal ganglion there. That's the ophthalmic division. This is a maxillary division. And this is a mandibular division. Okay. As we all know, this trigeminal nerve is the largest cranial nerve, motor, and sensory nerve root. And what we are interested of the three branches are the maxillary and the mandibular nerve. Mandibular nerve is a mixed nerve with afferent and nephron fibers, and largest of all the three divisions, which leaves the cr cranium through foramen ovale and then divides into anterior and posterior. Anterior trunk, which further divides into buccal nerve, deep temporal nerves, masseteric nerve. Posterior trunk, which divides into auricular temporal nerve, lingual nerve, and inferior auricular nerve. And this is a dermatome where they supply. Most important thing that you want, you need to know is the these are the dermatomes they supply the mandibular nerve. Immediately, when you give a mandibular nerve after successive paresthesia, first first the patient will send, say, I am having numbness of the lower lip. That is a very good sign. And also, if you furthermore successful, patient will say, I am having numbness over the anterior part of the anterior two third of the tongue. That is a cardiac sign. This is a cadaver dis dissection done by me. You can see I have peeled off the skin on one side of the face. And here you can see that's a temporal muscle. You can see the parotid gland. You can see the facial vein. And you can see the masseter muscle. When you peel off these masseter muscles, parotid gland, and etc., you will see the zygomatic arch, the conoid process of mandible, and condylar process of mandible. When you bisect this bone and then you go further inside, reflect the lateral pterygoid muscle and when you see there, you will see the branches of the mandibular nerve. As you see here, when you reflect it off, you will see the lingual nerve and the inferior alveolar nerve. You zoom on and you will see the branches of the mandibular nerve. So what are the vascular relations closely related to with uh, the branches of your external carotid, which is nothing but your maxillary artery. So very be cautious and also the plexus of your maxillary veins is also there in, the, in that mandibular fossa. So when you inject your drug, the most common thing that you end, end in is your last. So very be cautious while performing these blocks. So you can see that's a internal carotid artery, that's external carotid artery. It can uh, goes off and then gives rise to the super, uh, superficial temporal artery, and then the maxillary artery along with the maxillary veins. When you reflect these veins, you will see that two twigs, there, two large twigs, which is our branches of the mandibular nerve. What, uh, how I do it is midpoint of the mandibular fossa, you insert your needle. When you see it from the cephalod end, you will see the needle that is hitting the lateral delicate plate. This is a bit angulated it because the lateral delicate plate is much smaller. Sometimes it is broader, sometimes it is very small in certain individuals. In that case, you need to angulate in this manner, which is broader, the needle will be always much perpendicular to the mandibular fossa. You measure the distance from the skin you measure the distance from the skin to the lateral pterygoid plate. Then keep a finger there, pull out the needle, and then direct it 10 degree posterior and superior. Then again, you insert, you will hit the 
you will elicit paresthesia along the mandibular tooth. This is how we do it blindly. As you see here, the needle is being inserted. You see it's a lateral derivative plate. You can see the lateral derivative plate is very narrow in this individual. And you can see the distance from the lateral derivative plate to the branches of the mandibular nerve. So lateral derivative plate per se is a marker for us to find the mandibular nerve or the branches of the mandibular nerve. You can see here, you can see here, this is zygomatic arch. This is one of the vascular relations. The artery which crosses the lateral derivative plate is nothing but your max maxillary artery. And you can see the branches of the mandibular nerve. Landmark guided when you insert a needle perpendicular to the mandibular fossa, first slowly keep inserting, patient will say, and I will shock along this territory. See, he is very shock. And he is also showing his finger along the mandibular territory. This is how you do a blind block for mandibular nerve. And we can always use an ultrasound to. This is how you keep the L, uh, small footprint probe, that's L25. You have the, the other footprint probe also. And you come from lateral to medial. The sono anatomy that you get is, you can see if, uh, the, this is a condylar area, this is a conoid area. And you can see the temporal muscle there. And you can see the two heads of the lateral tergoid muscle and you can see a small mountain. I will call this as a small mountain because in every individual you see a small mountain like this. This is nothing but a lateral tergoid plate and lateral to it you will see the maxillary vein there, the nerve there and the artery below. When you insert a needle that's a cornered process of mandible. That's a lateral period, right? You started having pictures of your mandibular nerve. I think you are able to see the pictures of the mandibular nerve. When they cleanse the teeth. And we will, we will see here. So that's a that's a sign that we get when we use nerve stimulator and ultrasound along with it. How we will learn is first you insert the skull along with the mandible in a water bath. Move your probe from cephala to downwards. When you do so, first you will see the condylar process and the conoid process, and then they these two breaks off to give rise to a small mountain, which I call it is a lateral pterygoid plate. This will be the pterygoparatine fossa. So when you insert a needle in an out of plane manner, from, the, from here if you insert a needle, all you have to get into the lateral side of the lateral pterygoid plate. This is a medial side, this is a lateral side. So we need to get the needle on the lateral side of the lateral pterygoid plate. And also, you will see a hyperacoustic shadow there. That's a mandibular nerve. You see here, and insert many needle there. So now, at this point, I have removed everything. I removed, the, dislocated the mandible from the skull. Now you will see how close we are to the foramen nerve. See the needle to the foramen nerve. The nerve exits there, the needle in the right place, you will elicit good masseter contraction. And sometimes you will get false contraction also. I'll show you. This is the needle is just one centimeter or 0.5 cm, one centimeter inside the subcutaneous tissue, and you are eliciting there's a masseter nerve which comes out and supplies a. Mu muscle. 
you will elicit the same contraction as you see here. See? But the distance from the skin to the lateral pterygoid plate, which they observed in literatures when you go and see, is around roughly around 4.5 to 6 centimeters. As you see here, this is a perfect response. See the depth of the needle as a 10 centimeter needle is an using. That's 9, 8, 7, 8, 9, 7, 6, 5. Roughly around 4.5, 4.5 to 5 centimeter for every integer. They have a lot of dissection is being done and then they have confirmed the distance from the skin to the lateral pterygoid plate and the lat or the skin to the nose is roughly around 4.5 to 6 centimeters in every individual. Now come to maxillary nerve. Maxillary nerve exits uh, uh, cranium through forum and rotundum, located in the greater ring of sphenoid. Once outside the cranium, the nerve lies in the pterygopalatine fossa and then it divides. So we need to catch the nerve before it divides right into the pterygopalatine fossa. So this is a, when you remove this mandible, you will see the pterygopalatine fossa, you will see the lateral pterygoid plate. That's the pterygopalatine fossa, which I'm talking about. The nerve will, will come and we will be able to see the nerve that lies in the pterygopalatine fossa. I'll show you in the cadaver in a second. What we have done here is, you can see here, this is zygomatic bone, the, the masseter, masseter muscle, and below that you will have the lateral pterygoid muscle and uh, medial pterygoid muscle. You, you remove all these muscles, and then I passed a twig from the foramen rotundum. That's a, that's a middle cranial fossa. You can see the ophthalmic nerve, maxillary nerve, and mandibular nerve. This is the maxillary nerve. You insert a small pink twig. Let's see where it goes. And then I removed, removed the zygomatic arch. You can see the maxillary artery, which is close to the pterygopalatine fossa. You can see the pink twig that comes out of the middle crane fossa lies in the pterygopalatine fossa. That's nothing but here. Maxillary nerve. You zoom in, in all you need to find out this nerve before it divides into further branches. So, the right place to block the mandibular maxillary nerve is a pterygopalatine fossa. You can see here it divides into several branches and the dermatome they supply. So, this is infrazygomatic and this is suprazygomatic. This is a frondozygum officer. You have to angular uh, direct ear needs to the ala of nose for infrazygomatic directed toward needle towards the lower eyelid. So when you keep uh, keep the uh, small footprint probe, 25 mm, L25 probe, L25 mm probe. That's a lateral trigger plate. This is a trigger. You, you will see a U-shaped manner. That's the posterior surface of the maxilla. And then this is the trigger palatine fossa. When you insert a needle from lateral to medial, you will enter into the trigger palatine fossa and then you can give the drug. Same like this, frontozygomatic also can be done. You can see, you will see the condylar process of coronoid, coronoid process of mandible and the posterior surface of the maxilla. In an out of plane manner, the needle has to come and hit the pterygopalatine fossa and then you give the 3 ml of 0.5 percent of your cane. That's all it's needed. The water bath, let's see your frontozygomatic, suprazygomatic. That's a U-shaped manner. That's the pterygopalatine fossa that the needle is sitting. So the you place it there, then you give the drug. We'll have a successful maxillary nerve block.
So I want to show you when you are insert a needle where the needle goes. Then dislocate the mandible. Keep the, you can see the needle is right in place in the pterygoid palatine fossa, as you see there. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's what I'm here to say that uterine doesn't lie outside, it lies within. That's the beauty of God's creation. So, for uh, maxillary nerve block, what I use is 3 ml of 0.5 percentage glucocaine. And mandibular nerve block that I use is 3, 5 ml of 0.5 percentage glucocaine. If you are afraid of last, you can always add adrenaline to it. So, advantages of nerve block, you know, general nerve block, it, it gives you numerous advantages, known facts. There are a few evidences for it. When do you say no? When do you say you, you say it's a very bad facial trauma with head, head injury is on tracheostomy? Don't try to put a needle in. And also, don't try to put a needle in when you have a huge mass there and you want to give a post operative analysis. So, known complications always, any nerve block is always a list of complications. Sometimes, these ways, when you do a maxillary and mandibular nerve block, sometimes patient will have transient facial nerve block. Two key case scenarios this is all extra oral surgeries. So, this is zygomatic uh, arch elevation. What they do is they elevate the zygoma which is being fractured. I will perform the maxillary nerve block. The patient is sedated and is awake. You can see here, it's, it's a very good block for these sort of surgeries. And then any awake foreign body removal, you can do it. And any uh, already they, they are having a wound there. If they want to plate the maxilla, they can always do under uh, these uh, maxillary in the blood. Patient will be pain free. Pa patient is a bit sedated. When asked to open the patient is being sedated, you can see there. And then after Successful thing, patient is opening eyes and seeing what surgery is being going on. So another case plating is being done, patient is also awake. This is how they do the psychomagination. They have been de depressed there. There is another carcinoma of lip. Pati these patients are actually um, uh, have vas uh, vascular. Uh, uh, heart, heart disease patients, aortic stenosis, uh, mitral regurgitation, um, and bivalvular heart disease patients. Um, they want for they want they don't want to live with the fungating mass on their lips. They just want the cosmetic surgery where you can do under nerve blocks. Okay, you can see here no general anesthesia is being given. And these are another uh, high risk patient where with the chronic renal failure patients and associated uh, aortic stenosis coming for uh, debulking surgeries. There's something called debulking surgeries. Patient can, can't live with the mass in situ for a long time. After radiation, the mass, even the mass being uh, re reduced in size, patient, they'll have always a foul mouth smelling. Uh, we didn't do a hemimandibulectomy, we just removed the mask. As you see here, the mask is being removed. I can always do a hemimandibulectomy also, but we didn't do it. You can see it's a chronic kidney disease patient with valvular heart disease. This is another mitral stenosis, young fellow with uh, mandibular fracture. You can see here it's a cardiomegaly there. The surgery is being performed 
and patient is sitting on right on the operating table without any discomfort. You can see the clearance, the, the bright face that he gives up, that means he is off pain. You can see here, that's a rheumatic heart disease, mitral stenosis is severe, mild to moderate mitral regurgitation, AR, PR, pulmonary hypertension, moderate. These are the patients who are demanding for lungs. You can see his uh, CT lungs, that is axial section. You can see there's a bit of uh, pulmonary edema also there. Another patient where they benefit out of, uh, uh, for post-operative for pain relief is the commander surgeries or flap, rotator flap resection. Before that, you need to give the blocks and then they give, do the flap and then these patients uh, do well in the post-operative period, even with, added with general anesthesia. This is another the patient is a rose, uh, totally shattered maxilla. So um, for maxillary impaction, you need to give good post-operative pain relief. So when you have a successful maxillary nerve block, this is how the patient points out to you. See, on the cheek, the upper lip, the nose, also the, cheek, the lower eyelid. This is how they, they point out to you. When you have a successful maxillary and a man, mandible marble, see, the patient is saying lower eyelid, low upper lip, lower lip, maxillary division, max, mandibular division, and also the he himself put out the sun tongue and saying that I'm a man, I'm a son, I'm a That's all, folks. That's a successful maxillary and mandible and nerve block, which I could. Uh, uh, that's how, how I'm, I'm here to teach you how I learned, how I did my uh, cadaver dissections, my own dissections, and then um, there is no, I'm not teaching from any article. This is my uh, decade of experience through this maxillary and mandibular. See you folks in the next session. Bye-bye.